Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Financial Innovation. We're in virtual mode. We're looking at the same sorts of things as we did in the real world and technology and fintech in particular are two of the major things that we have focused on both in the real world and in the videos that we have produced over the last year. Uh, what we haven't, however, done very much of is take a kind of real blue sky view of where fintech is going and what technology actually can do in the financial services sector. I'm thinking particularly of artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, whether we have, or whether you, if, you can, if you want to call it artificial intelligence or you want to call it augmented intelligence, whether you want to call it machine learning, it all is the same kind of thing. It's this sort of uh, the the sort the the what's a positive a positive loop uh, in which technology breeds technology and change accelerates and I'm delighted that we've got three experts uh, from each side of the Atlantic um, to look at this. I'm not saying this very well today. Bear with me. Uh, but coming from the West Coast, I think he's currently in Seattle. Is that right? is Robert Scoble. Robert Scoble is an Amer American technologist. He was defined in The Economist, and I think this is a wonderful quote, a minor celebrity among geeks worldwide. <laughs> that was a, a plus or a negative. Uh, he's a legend in technology, according to other sources. He's a dropout in journalism from San Jose State who went into technology only because he clearly couldn't make a living in journalism. Uh, he publishes something called the Scobalizer, the Scobalizer blog, which is extremely influential, uh, which he founded when he was a technology evangelist at Microsoft. Uh, he's been studying change to come since 1971. Uh, he's, uh, he's worked with Microsoft, he's worked with PopTech, First Fast Company, Rockspace, Building 43 and Upload, but we have him here uh, sitting in his Tesla and talking yeah. about the future. After him, we have Christian Horhus, who is the co-founder and CTO of Pactum AI. Now, he is, uh, head, uh, he is also head of data at Starship Technologies. We actually had his brother on a... Uh, on a, a video a few months ago. Uh, obviously, um, he's uh, he's a graduate, he's a PhD in computer science from the University of Tartu in Estonia. Obviously, Estonia is leading in many ways in, in what you can do with artificial intelligence and what you can do with machine learning. So he provides a very solid, um, shall we say, counterpoint to the airy, spacey, West Coast uh, vision of uh, <laughs> then batting cleanup is Charlotte G, her, who is a journalist with MIT's uh, Tech Review. She is also the founder of Geneo, which is a diversity and tech uh, advocacy group. She's a former editor of Tech World, uh, and she uh, also has a sort of odd academic background, a, an MA from City University in political journalism. It is fascinating how people who start off in journalism end up in tech. Uh, my colleagues <laughs> and I will ask the odd question, but I think the idea is that we will get a uh, discussion going. And if Robert isn't running away, I'll ask Robert, first of all, to kick off. Robert Scoble, I give, I give you Robert Scoble from the West Coast yeah. of America. Thank you. I was, I was just going to go in because it, as you were talking, um, I realized just how much AI and machine learning has changed my life. From the oven I use, which is a June oven, this just got sold to Weber, the barbecue company. It has a camera in the top of it. And if I put uh, food in there, like a, a piece of salmon, it recognizes that automatically. And my music, if you look at the uh, Facebook portal device that I have over here, um, the... Uh, Facebook portal device has camera and microphone in it and has an Amazon Alexa in it. And I can talk to Amazon Alexa and say, uh, play some music. Well, if it goes to Spotify, the playlists are done by AI, right? So my music is being picked by uh, machine learning. And of course, I have a Tesla out in the garage. I'm going to go sit out here so I don't wake up the rest of the family because it's seven in the morning here in, uh, in Silicon Valley. By the way, I'm in California, not Seattle anymore. Um, and now I'm sitting in a car that autonomously drives 
most of the places and has most 19 of <laughs> most of the places most of the time sorry i'm gonna have to switch back my mic hold on um and this this car has 19 uh machine learning subsystems that drive the car that accelerate the car and do all all sorts of other things and even my head i'm wearing this new apple ai headphone and um ai is running already running uh listening to this audio stream and is pulling noise out for instance uh last week i was talking to somebody and a lawnmower started up right next to me and he said it was like somebody just turned the audio all the way down to zero uh, and that was AI doing its work and it, it got rid of the lawnmower and I was standing right next to the running lawnmower, right? So we're starting to see um, machine learning affect literally every part of my life. Uh, and it might not have gotten to your life yet, you think, but we know it's watching uh, our money for fraud and other things as well. So when you call the bank up, it all... Uh, uh, already knows who you are based on your voice that's ai running and it also uh is watching your spending patterns and looking for uh people stealing your money and that's ai running now so we have an interesting new um technique in software that didn't exist 10 years ago right I was the first one to see Siri. Siri was the first consumer app to have to use these techniques underneath. And today, Apple now is dedicating a third of its chips. Uh, the M1 chip, if you look at it, a third of the size now is dedicated to neural network processing. Most of that is still not used today. So that is what, what I think is going to be interesting to talk about today is what are we going to do with the that? Uh, uh chip in everybody's homes uh that's coming soon what what is this industry and others going to do with it and i have a whole bunch of uh ideas because uh, i wrote a book called the infinite retina with irena cronin and uh in there we we talk about spatial computing and spatial computing is computing where uh you a robot or a virtual being can move through space like this car. This car is a great example of a spatial computer. It actually moves around inside a computer, if you think about it the right way. And to run this, we have to build a lot of AI systems. Well, soon we're going to be looking, uh, using AI in, in our financial systems as well, if we aren't already using it. So I, I just wanted to kick it off and see if we can get a discussion yeah, going because bother you. I mean, you know, you're a techno and tech techno evangelist, but does it worry you for, as you're also, I imagine, a libertarian? Does the fact that, uh, as you as you say, this chip has boundless capacity? It has yeah. boundless capacity for the Big Brother to watch you. And I do remember. Um, I can't remember which. Yeah whether it was Mark Zuckerberg or Steve Jobs or whoever it was, put a little uh, bit of scotch tape over the camera on his PC because he wasn't sure that somebody wasn't watching him. Uh, yeah. you, does that bother you? What's the um, oh, there's a lot. There's a pretty significant downside if you, if you uh, go all the way with this technology. There's a little camera looking at me in this Tesla, by the way. It's, a, it's up here. I can't really show it to you. It's up above the mirror. And this camera already it has about uh, 14 different things it recognizes. For instance, it recognizes if I'm holding a phone in my hand and it starts nagging me more often to touch the car and get back involved in the act of driving, right? Um, even though this car is really starting to self-drive at a pretty good rate. Um, it, it also looks at, am I tired? Are my eyes open, right? It can see that from three feet away uh, for both driver and passenger, right? And it can see who is sitting in the car. If it had uh, some sort of uh, body recognition or face recognition, uh, there's talk of putting sensors in the seats in future cars where it would even know the weight of each person and know, oh, my wife is sitting in the driver's seat and I'm sitting in the passenger seat, right? That's really scary information to give to a, 
a, a big company like a Tesla. But soon we're going to be wearing devices that give an Apple or a Facebook or a Google a lot more data about what we are buying, what we're looking at, what we're eating, what we're touching, and where everything is in our uh, life. Uh, Apple's engineers are already designing systems for future products that'll remember where you left your keys in your house. Well, if it can remember where it left your keys in the house, it can remember where you left everything in your house. And that's a lot of data for a big multinational company to have. And I, I trust Apple and most people I do my research with when I talk to them about this and explain just how much data they're about to give a big company, they say, oh, we trust Apple. I go, well, would you buy the same thing from a Facebook or from a Google? And they're like, well, no, I don't trust those as well as Apple. But we will buy th these glasses that are coming from, from these companies. Okay, well, way. in the financial services sector, one of the great concerns about, uh, about AI is that um, the, the algorithms may well reinforce discrimination, may yes. well reinforce prejudices. Um, and what, yes. you, where are you? You're in uh, it, jail. You're it, entitled. It, 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 oh, well, I'm privileged and entitled in a lot, a lot of ways. It's interesting. I was talking to a black civil rights uh, uh, leader yesterday. Uh, he, he, he was the first black kid in his white high school, uh, elementary school, due to desegregation. So he was literally the first uh, to go to a desegregated uh, school in the South. So imagine how, how much... Uh, crap he got this is a real problem because ai picks up the patterns that we already have right um it can figure out what a stop sign is pretty easily because it has been trained what a stop sign looks like and it was trained by uh, us that is not that dangerous but when we pick up the patterns of our spending and our behaviors in life, we can really reinforce some negative things that existed in the past. Um, and so we need to design these systems so that they accentuate our better angels and not uh, our, not our uh, uh, you know, patterns of wealth in the past. I can figure out probably your, your um, credit score within a few Within a within a, few, a dozen points, right? Just by looking at the last five hotels you stayed in, right? Because if you have good credit and you're wealthy, you're probably staying in things like a Four Seasons, and if you don't, you're probably staying in something like a Motel Eight. So I can get pretty close to your credit score with just a few pieces of data, and if I can do that, my AI can pick up on. Us on who we are and keep us from having uh, access to things, right? Just because of our credit scores. Very so, nice. so you have some sort of uh, human intervention to stop AI actually undermining uh, your value system. I, I, I think you have to redesign your value system, not based on the past pattern of human behavior, because the past pattern of human behavior. It has had negative uh, decisions made on it, right? We have to look at a, a better pattern recognizer for the future. Yeah. Okay, well, let, let me ask uh, Christian. Christian, how do you see this? I mean, you take, I imagine, a, a, a what's the word, a, a, a very a rather cold and calculating view of, uh, of what AI and machine learning can do. And Estonia has been enormously successful in implementing uh, e Estonia, what's what's your view of what you're hearing from Robert? Um, uh, hi, I'm glad to be here. Uh, yeah, it's extremely fascinating. Um, I'm I, I've heard about these discriminations and and biases and so on, and of course we have seen examples of them. But um, one of the core reason why we started uh, Vacuum AI to do automating to automate commercial negotiations with AI was the reason that people are biased 
people have bad moods sometimes, people abuse their power, uh, uh, they are sometimes not prepared, they cannot sometimes calculate well enough all the different dimensions and trade-offs and so on. And, and, and a lot was said about discrimination, but I would argue that it's a lot easier to fix discrimination in software than it is to fix it in humans. For fixing it in humans, it takes many generations, but fixing it in software, I mean, it, it takes in months, in years uh, uh, to fix it if you need to do it. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not worried at all about discrimination. I think the more software we have, the easier it is to uh, force legally for companies not to discriminate and then to actually implement it as well. But it's very difficult to change people. So uh, I, I wouldn't, I'm, I'm not worried about it. I think we are heading in a, in a very good direction. Um, and uh, like Big Brother watching you, I mean, yes, they are watching, but, but on the other hand, at least we know that they are watching. Uh, <laughs> my, uh, my parents were uh, 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 growing up in Soviet Union and then they didn't know who was watching them, but they knew that someone is watching them. <laughs> Uh, but now at least we know, we know the device and we know how to put it away and so on. Um, and again, the company should still uh, obey the law and, and, and they can be audited and it can be changed, whatever is allowed and not. So I'm again, of course, being a futurist and, and a tech person, uh, not worried about it. Um, yeah. What about uh, Bactium? So I said that we are automating commercial negotiations and it does seem that it is very human-like thing to negotiate, to discuss things. And, and it goes very well uh, with Robert's talk that it comes closer and closer in absolutely any field. And uh, our customers are largest in the world, including Walmart, for example, and they have tens of thousands of suppliers and they just don't have time uh, to deal with small, smaller ones. So 80% of them are like, long tail or unmanaged and and they just these small suppliers they don't have a possibility to discuss anything and there is huge value lost in there because negotiation means that you are doing trade-offs you are uh, the other side doesn't have to agree on a new contract but in order for the other side to agree then you are making trade-offs to making it better and better the contract for both parties otherwise the other side wouldn't accept it and and we have seen like huge amount of value increase uh, due to this possibility for technology to be rational, to think about all the terms at once in multidimensional space that humans are kind of a bit lacking in uh, being prepared, having all the data in the world. And, and, and so far, how people like Teslas and how they like Spotify music recommendations in the, exactly the uh, same way, if we are asking in end, would you like to do it again with a bot or with a human? Like more than 80% of the time, they say that they prefer the bot, not the human next time. And, and it is the same trend. You can iterate the software, you can improve it, you can reduce biases, you can reduce discrimination, you can make it nicer uh, because it's software, it's easily updatable. You cannot solve the bad mood of a person or, or uh, that easily. And, and uh, it is fascinating how we are giving bits and bits to systems that are performing better and more efficiently. Um, so, yeah. So okay, Leighton has a couple of questions for you specifically, but then I want to bring Charlotte in. But Leighton, for, for Christian. Yeah, I'm, um, I was wondering, um, I mean, it's a bit of, bit of a predictable question, but the, the COVID, COVID impact um, on your business and how you're seeing the AI sector, how is that affecting your business? And also, um, do you think there is clarity on these trends? Are these trends here to stay? Or are they, you know, is this just brought about because, you know, the, uh, you know we've digitized uh, forcibly um, and we'll retreat somewhat? Or it, so I'm interested to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, first of all, I've got the personal story. Like I'm a co-founder of a company and, and we started uh, raising our second round of funding. And at the first day with the first investor, the Nasdaq had dropped 30% due to COVID. And, and we started our fundraising at that point. 
and of course it looked like a disaster and and like everyone was so so worried but uh, we all know what happened is that technology has never been performing better than at that time so we closed our round we were doing better than ever before and then we realized that like the core reason why technology is doing well is that especially in times of covid when you maybe don't want to meet with people maybe you don't want to fly like all the bits of uh, technology that there are were actually more valuable than before and the same applied for us and uh, so for us i wouldn't say that it's fully positive because still like economic uncertainty is is still making things a bit like uncertain uh, uh, but uh, but on the other hand uh, like and it's difficult to compare but i think that for tech companies usually the trend is that it's definitely positive and for fintech companies uh, it seems also that it's positive um like an easy example you're giving less money on hand and more over wire transfer and it's just because you cannot meet them and you cannot travel so in general it seems that uh, that it's extremely good for tech it seems extremely good for fintech and i guess it's not that bad for uh, uh, old school finance either um and yeah. pretty terrible for the real economy however let me bring in charlotte charlotte um you know here are two tech evangelists um the future is tech the future is great we don't worry about uh, privacy issues we trust apple um you know uh, do we trust Apple? I mean, are you as optimistic? I mean, you're also a techie to your fingertips, but do, do you do you share their optimism about the future, and particularly in financial services, which is rife with uh, discrimination of one sort or another, prejudices of one sort or another, and yet is absolutely fundamental to the health of the both UK and global economy? Yes, occasionally I do feel like I'm on a different planet to some of the people I talk to in tech, and I'm definitely feeling that, feeling that right now. I think I just want to kick off with a quote from Elon Musk, you know, Tesla, Tesla's founder, which is humans are underrated. Um, and I think a lot of people in tech, you know, can get so sort of blown away by things that they sort of forget the, the end user, the human being is surely the most important thing in all of this. I also think the conversation is so far away from where a lot of banks are. You know, I can't even, I'm struggling to think how banks use AI right now, really apart from chatbots, which to be honest, we all actually hate. We'd, we'd much rather speak to a human because they can deal with about three things and, the, and then that, that's the limit of their technical capability. So, you know, you can, you can use AI for detecting fraud and, and for voice transactions and for compliance. Um, most banks, I don't know if they're even doing that. Um, but also don't forget, you know, we all talk about, we talk about AI, the bad guys have AI as well. So it also speeds up the ability of people to crack into banks. Um, and I think a, a lot of banks, you know, they, they haven't even done the, the very early stuff you have to do before you talk about AI, but getting your, you know, your data in basic order. Um, so I think, I think some of them are just going to be listening to this with, with sort of, um, jaws wide open. And, and I guess that. Uh, I I would sort of uh, make the argument for look to be clear here. I'm not saying don't use AI in banking or financial services. That is absolutely not what I'm saying. But I'm just saying before we rush in, we really, really do need to think this through. Um, credit algorithms are a growing issue in the US because in in many ways they've been a disaster for some people. Um, say you're a victim of coercive control and your partner has maxed out your bank account. And is using you for, for money and, and basically your credit credit store is dreadful. An algorithm, there's very little way to repeal that because the algorithm is deciding it, not a person. There isn't a, oh, you can just speak to this named individual to fix it. You're, you're an individual against a faceless system that is not designed with, with you in mind. Um, so I guess we have to be careful what we automate. We have to be careful what we give um, decision making over to. Um, and I know that Kristen was kind of saying about humans. Um, I mean, actually, you can fix humans. Fixing humans is pretty easy. Like if they're willing to change, you can definitely fix them. But um, in all seriousness, you know, at least you can interrogate a human being and say, why did you do that? You know, we have to be so careful that, that when we're creating these systems, they are um, explainable and they're accountable and that they're tested and introduced really slowly. Yeah. 
Um, because if we're not careful, we could sleepwalk into, frankly, a, a pretty hellishly dystopian financial future. So um, I'm trying not to be the voice just of doom and gloom here. I do think there's a lot of really exciting promise, but I guess I'm just saying like, let's like just take a deep breath test it slowly really think you know what do we want to put in the power in the power of machines what do we want humans to decide over let's not just go all gung ho all gun blazing robert yeah you, you brought up a really great point about the transparency of these systems the in old school uh computer so software you could actually look at the code and figure out what it was doing right uh how it was written in these new systems, you're training an inference engine. And let me see if I can explain that in English. Um, the founder of Turo, which Apple bought actually is a little startup. I heard him speak at the data science conference one time. And he said, we, we trained our AI to see the difference between wolves and huskies, two kinds of dogs. And Every once, and the way it, 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 you train it, you, you give it a bunch of different images of huskies and a bunch of different images of wolves. And you say, that's a wolf and that's a husky, that's a wolf. And then the AI um, builds a, a very complex mathematical structure to, on the pattern, right? So it starts recognizing the difference. And they said it started throwing some errors. And it, it, if you're, training an AI system, it should never throw an a error, right? Uh, if I train a system to recognize a, a stop sign, like in this car, it better always recognize stop signs and it better never uh, say that's a, that's not, that's a yield sign or something like that, right? But this system was throwing errors every once in a while, it would say a wolf is a husky when it wasn't. And they, had to really uncompile how this mathematical structure got built to understand what it was doing. And what it did w was learn on the wrong thing. It, it started learning about snow in the picture. And most of the time that was accurate because a husky, huskies are usually on snow up in Alaska and wolves are usually in grass, like in Yellowstone National Park, right? And so it was, pretty accurate, but it wasn't 100% accurate. And so they had to take the snow out of the picture before they did the retraining so that the AI learned on the face of the dog and not on the snow in the picture around the dog, right? And that's a good example of that, that, that these things can learn an improper behavior if they're taught wrongly. And they're also very not transparent because that mathematical structure that gets built is really hard for hum humans to figure out what the heck it's doing. Yeah, and so what, saying, even, what Charlotte was saying. I mean, how do yeah. you resolve that? Uh, you know, Charlotte's there, point is absolutely fine. There's, there's new AI systems, uh, and, and I talked to a guy at VMware who's helping to build one of them with uh, NVIDIA that will be more transparent so that regulators can figure out what the AI is actually doing. And, and so that humans can figure out what is actually going on, right? And fix the problems uh, over time as, as uh, we're talking about here. So th these are valid concerns and they, and they certainly do retard uh, the usage of AI in a highly regulated business, which financial services is highly regulated because the regulators need the ability to look at that complex mathematical structure and figure out what the heck it's doing to human beings, right? Are you comfortable with that, Charlotte? Yeah, I mean, I, certainly, um, I think Robert made, made a very good point around um, regulators, you know, uh, uh, frankly, you know, you look at some of the most cutting edge, uh, I'd say DeepMind, who are, are producing some of the most interesting research within AI, even they don't understand how some of their systems have, have reached the conclusions or done the things they've done. So I guess, I, I guess I'm just saying that that's not, while that can be impressive and we can definitely use some of that technology for certain applications, when it comes to financial services, we don't know how it reached that decision, just isn't good enough. Um, and yeah. like Robert says, regulators won't accept that either. So I, I guess, you know, we, we just have to, that doesn't mean that you have to throw 
all of this out, it just means that, um, you know, we have to potentially there are some areas of financial services that AI will never get into that never should get into. But it means we just have to figure out a bit more carefully um, what we think is suitable, which is too sensitive. Tell us, tell us what, in your view, AI, where AI can be useful in the financial services sector and where it can be dangerous. Where do you what? what what are the lines? There? Sort of like I referenced earlier, like, you know, detecting fraud um, and, and compliance and stuff that I think AI could be very useful for that, even if even if we don't necessarily because it's because obviously a lot, a lot of that is around pattern recognition and looking at, you know, why is that person? You know, we, we've all had transactions occasionally stopped by banks and it's actually kind of reassuring when that happens because you want you want your bank to be making sure that um that it's not a fraudulent transaction. So I think that's a that's a big one. Um, I guess there are certainly kind of on the slightly fluffier end, like consumer interaction stuff that 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 can definitely be, you know, with with voice dis, voice assistance and stuff like that. Um, but I'm I'm just not sure about uh, when we get to stuff around transactions trading. That kind of scares me slightly because you know humans work at a fixed speed. Machines, nothing stopping a machine. So when they go wrong, they go so wrong that they could like move a whole market. Um, so, you know, finance is already pretty opaque. Like, I'm not going to sit here and pretend I understand the world of finance, frankly. In fact, I don't really know anyone who does, which scares me when I say that. Um, so that's I already okay. a machine that does. <laughs> you know, but then, yeah. then introducing machines into that mix. It, you know what I mean? It's just it's it just kind of scares me. Um, but yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, am, I am a bit confused uh, because like transparency in AI, uh, Yes, of course, we cannot fully know and understand everything, but transparency in people, I cannot even kind of count their neurons, nor their activity of neurons, nor their connections. And if I'm asking them, then they might not remember, they might remember incorrectly, they might lie purposefully. And what is the problem of deep mind not being able to understand why AlphaGo was playing this Go move? Human cannot do it either. The best player in the world yes. cannot explain to no one why they did it. Uh, but if I would compare which of these systems is more transparent, it's definitely AI. In there, I can go layer by layer. I can see historically what data was fed into it. I can do infinite number of tests on it. Even if it is a black box, I can test it in court with different data things, which I cannot do with humans. I would argue they are a lot more transparent than humans are. Uh, and another thing, uh, like, like the finance gets too complex and we don't understand it. Like bio biology has always been too complex and we don't understand biology either. Like, like so what? Yeah. And, and we, we don't understand ecosystems or brains or anything like this. And, and, and for me, like, like fraud is okay, but like credit scoring isn't okay. Like, I mean, they're about the same thing. Like, should I, like, is it decent to do this trade? Uh, like, should I give money or are they allowed to transfer the money? And, and if in one place the AI is super powerful and better than humans, then like from where the logic comes that it isn't in the other case. Uh, like I am, uh, it seems way more uh, techno-optimist, uh, uh, even to the limit of, uh, of, uh, of all these participants who are techno-optimists. <laughs> I think you are probably more optimistic because I, I don't know what the political situation in Estonia is, but the political situation in the United right. States and to a lesser extent, but significantly in the UK as well, says that it is awfully dangerous to start using machines to produce, to, to work on, on racial or gender based data uh, which is itself historical. It will come out in the future with um, with conclusions that are fundamentally discriminatory. And this has happened repeatedly in, uh, in the use of machine learning in financial services. Uh, I don't know- It applies to people. Like, like lawyers and, and uh, courts have been proven to be uh, uh, racially discriminating as well, and policemen. I, I'm not saying that they are yeah. not, I'm just more worried about people and changing people and and understanding the why, why people were doing these decisions and so on yes uh, to take it out to take it out of fin financial services i i'm sitting in a car with 19 ai systems that drives me and drives me better than humans do in a lot of ways uh 
uh, you know, just a few weeks ago, I put up a video video of me not using my hands on the steering wheel. And I was driving 70 miles an hour with barriers on both sides of my uh, my uh, lane. And that scared, uh, that scared a lot of people. A lot of people are like, put your hands on the wheel. And I'm like, no, if I put my hands on the wheel, I actually increase the chances that this car is going to kill me because the AI is so good at navigating through complex structures uh, already. And um, I trust this car with my life, right? The co computers, the 18 billion transistors that are uh, running the AI systems are already better at running this car than I am. Yeah, but so I, I totally... You, you know rationally that? that your car may be safer if you don't drive it than if you get into a Chevy and you do drive it. That may be yes. true. But on the other hand, you may well eventually hit a baby. And if you do right. hit a baby in a Tesla, it is going to crater the market for Teslas. No, that's not true. Lawsuits and lawsuits and lawsuits. It may be That's not true. I a, fr a friend of mine just lost her nine-year-old daughter to a drunk driver who hit her while riding a bike. And so human beings do this every day. And we can, like, like uh, we're discussing here, we can prove the safety of these systems uh, at, at a much higher rate than with humans. Humans are actually a real problem in the world. And we already kill in America, 33,000 people in cars every year uh, because of humans. And that problem is going to get go way down in, in my kid's lifetime. Only right? if you kill all the lawyers. Uh, Charlotte. Yeah, no, I was just thinking, I think the difficulty is that we we can't pretend that AI is some pure thing that's divorced from human beings. It isn't. That's human true. beings make it and they fill it with all of their own biases and all of their own their own kind of beliefs. So I guess part of this comes down to power and decision making. Who builds the AIs? Because I can tell you it's mostly not women. It's mostly not black people. It's mo you know, it's mostly not poorer people. So I, the thing I worry about is that it's easy to be sanguine about this when you're unlikely to be the person at the sharp end of the kind of risks that I'm talking about around stuff like like the, the credit score algorithm uh, down ranking you, for example. So uh, I just think that, you know, it's difficult. I can totally see the, the point of view that says, look, human beings basically suck at a lot of stuff. Let's replace them. Yes. Let, let's do some of that, but it's just, we can't pretend that AI exists in its own perfect bubble. Uh, humans make it, it's from humans. So, you know, I, I guess I guess it's it's just, I just think we need to introduce a degree of complexity into this argument. You know, it's not kind of like AI is bad, humans are good. It, uh, you, you see what I mean? I, I, I here, agree. Here, here's a, yeah, I want to throw it in a different way because we, we We've been over indexing on on the uh, downsides and and not indexing enough on the benefits. For instance, if if I'm wearing a pair of glasses in 2030, let's say uh, almost a decade from now, we're all going to be computing in glasses. A Apple and Facebook are spending tens of billions of dollars developing these these products for the next decade. And let's say I'm talking to my bank or talking to my uh, uh, store of wealth or whatever. Well, I I could, for instance, right now I'm uh, my wife and I are looking at buying a house, so we're starting to talk to the financial system again about that, right? Well, hey, financial system, what what where is our bank? Where is our uh, uh, lowest interest rate that we could get with our current credit score, right? And computers could give us a variety of different choices with different. Uh, aspects of each lender, right? You know, how much closing costs do they have? What's their interest rate? What's the terms? What's the likely likelihood they're going to charge me late fees, right? A computer can figure out that out and present it to me and very quickly and give us real significant benefits. Uh, uh, cheaper rates, for instance, because a computer can go through hundreds of different bank plans and pick out the best ones for us. And I can't do that work. 
I'm not that good at calling all the different banks and figuring out who has the ability to loan me money to buy a house. But the AI systems could look through hundreds of different banks' uh, offerings and present them to me. As a consumer, this is really positive. This is why I like my June oven. My June oven cooks food that I can't cook I, and, and does it very reliably, much more reliably than our old oven does. And, from, and this from, car drives. From the consumer's point of view, I'm sure you're absolutely right. From the bank's point of view, if you start using AI, however, and it, when it comes to mortgage lending, uh, there is the danger that it will reinforce redlining because there are yep. historic problems in black neighborhoods with default rates and so on and so forth. And these get built into the algorithms and they become hidden somewhere within the code, uh, but they produce an outcome which is socially dysfunctional. I mean, it's, it's, it's already doing that though, with even without AI. And I'm not asking it to, to make the loan. I just want it to present to me the, the, the best possible loans, right? Um, and yes, we have to worry about the downsides. We know there are downsides, right? Um, if you don't know that as a technologist, that you know you haven't really studied history very well. But we have we have deep benefits to consumers for for these products that are going to be very compelling to people and to businesses. Christian, you want to come? Yeah, uh, I want to say that uh, I, I completely uh, agree with Charlotte in a sense that uh, technology is powerful and AI is powerful and power gives a lot of power, obviously. <laughs> and, and it should be uh, thought about how it's used and, and how it's regulated and so on. Like, I, I'm not agreeing at all on, on these things. Uh, what I, I guess I, I just said that it's, it's in a way easier and faster to regulate algorithms it's possible to go into detail with them, that it's not so easy with people and so on. Uh, so the centralization and possibility to iterate and this thing being a software makes it actually more easy for like the uh, democratic system to enforce laws and, and change it into the desired way. Um, yeah. It definitely must be done. If it's not done, then, then we are in trouble. Uh, but, uh, but that's why we have governments and, and systems to do it. Leighton, you wanted to come in on this. Yeah, I, um, I mean, I think fundamentally a lot of it is how do you, um, how do you ferment uh, a safe and sustainable um, environment for AI? And I think a core of that is education. So education of policymakers, because I don't think many policymakers understand AI personally. Um, and secondly, education of those who are running these systems. So um, I, people who are operating these systems, you know, they may have the uh, supercomputer, but if they don't know how to use it, then it's sort of a bit useless. Um, and if you've got these larger neural networks and you can't, you know, you, you, the wrong person is managing it or um, utilizing it, then you're not going to get good outcomes. So I, I think education of policymakers, and I'm sure Christian is the right person to be running an AI startup, uh, but there are people who maybe are running these things and they don't know what they're doing properly. Yeah. I don't think, I There's, just want to jump, jump in. This. I, I just want to say, it's not, so much that they, it's not so much that they don't know what they're doing, it's more just that they think that they're apart from society. And they don't think that, do you, if you see what I mean, they, they don't recognize that technology is part of society and plays a role within it. And they feel that it's morally neutral. Yeah, they feel it's morally neutral, but in reality, it's not. I mean, yeah, I, at MIT Technology Review, we very much uh, are sort of really over the phrase technology is neutral because it actually really isn't. <laughs> um, but, but I guess, sorry, that is all I wanted to say. I'm not gonna, not gonna steal, the, steal the limelight. Yeah. The other thing that's going on right now and, and what makes this an interesting time to talk about AI is the cost of training these systems is going way down. It used to, to train it on a stop sign, for instance. It used to take uh, uh, tens of thousands, if not millions of dollars to do that. And uh, you had to have co quite, quite expensive systems. Um, the cost now is about a dollar to do that, right? And and that, that 
trend of reducing the cost of training these systems means that they're going to be used for more and more things. Why, why is the cost coming down so much? Um, innovation in the, in the software. I mean, I, keep in mind, this, ex, this system didn't exist, in, at least in the consumer space, a decade ago. Siri was, came out just about a decade ago. And now so many of our things in our lives are being run by these systems. And Apple is dedicating a third of their chip to this new right. uh, the reason processor. I'm is because in the financial services sector, primarily in Europe, yep. but I think it's also happening in the US. We have something called open banking. So if yep. you are willing to, to, to commit open banking, all your data, all your data is accessible. Um, yep. So there's been an explosion in data for yes. uh, intelligent systems to work on. So the combination, yep. the massive improvement, massive increase in the size of the available data pool and the falling cost of uh, intelligent systems applied to that data produces, I don't know what, it produces a new world. I mean, I'm not quite sure where that goes, whether it's good or bad. My, I, I'm, a yeah. where I'm a little slow technology. Let, when, when this car really does fully self-drive and we can argue whether it's two years or five years or 10 years, everybody I talk to says it's certainly by 10 years from now that we're going to have fully self-driving cars that don't need humans to drive around. The cost of transportation in that world goes from about $60 retail to about 10. And that's a huge shift in cost for human beings. Now think about delivery services that need uh, transportation. Think about trucking that needs transportation. Think about taxi systems that need tra transportation. All of those systems are going to get cheaper because of AI. And yes, that has another downside we haven't even talked about, which is jobs. We have a new jobs problem coming because of these technologies. But where, where I'm going with this is this is dr going to dramatically change our systems and our cost of our systems. Because if I can move uh, groceries from my Safeway, from my grocery store to my front door with a technology like this, I can also do the same thing with my banking system and reduce the cost of dealing with my banking system. And so I should get fewer fees over time, right? Well, one of the problems with the banking system and, and Charlotte is, would, would really be the expert on this, is that they're stuck with yep. legacy systems. And it's awfully hard, as I understand it, to build a new system on top of an old system, particularly when that new system probably only has a life of three or four years, and you're going to have to plunk another system on top of it. However, the yeah. fact that systems are, are, the cost of those systems is falling so fast means that you might just be able to clean the whole lot out and start again over a weekend. I don't know how yeah. Charlotte feels about that. Yeah, that's Go ahead, Cheryl. I, I kind of start. I kind of started off um, as you referenced covering um, not so much not so much politics, although that was my MA. But but government um, and government and banks have a lot in common in terms of their legacy legacy systems, and it's kind of a, a bit of a disaster. Um, but yeah, absolutely. A lot a lot of them just fundamentally need to just let go of their existing systems. They're gonna to have to pretty much completely replace them and scrap them in order for them to be able to, to make use of a lot of the new technologies that we're talking about. Um, so yeah, I, I think unfortunately for a lot of banks, you know, tinkering around the edges, it, it just isn't really gonna cut it anymore. And also a lot of them still don't understand that if they're not, if they don't become a tech company, they will eventually lose all their customers. You know, they can't think of themselves anymore as like a bank that just has someone who does the tech. People expect, uh, you know, their expectations, thanks to, to, to um, banks like Monzo in the UK, are, are kind of through the roof now. People want, want to be able to access everything instantly. You know, they, they want a really yeah. easy, seamless experience. So if a bank isn't isn't kind of offering that, and in, you know, whatever that may be in future, that, that might be, AI enabled, and um, they they will be, uh, well, they'll they'll lose their customers. So I, I think it, it's kind of got to be a bit of a wake up call for banks. Um, I don't know course, whether they're well, hearing it. <laughs> the problem there with banks yeah. that have tried to change their systems, and there are, are examples around the world of banks that have said, okay, we must ditch our 
20 year old system and we must put in place a new one and here it is we'll do it over the weekend they screw up they screw yes. up monumentally and they lose their customer base because they're sick of that kind of nonsense well, it's fraught with risk i mean do, doing yeah. it is difficult you, you need to basically you need to spend a lot of money doing it you need to hire people that are yeah. the best in the field you need to not don't see that as a cost saving exercise but what it will do is save you money but that will be way down the line you just have to put your hand in your pocket in the short term yeah. and, and and things will be better further further ahead i visited a bank in brazil called new bank and they completely rethought uh what their bank was and and by the way when i visited you had to wait six months just to get a credit card there was so much demand to join this this new bank and it's done very well since i visited but they built for, for instance they built their own uh customer relationship management system so when you call the bank your phone call gets routed by their own system to an employee and so that uh uh you were talking to a real human being uh, faster than with their competitor, right? Which gets to Charlotte's point, which is treat humans better uh, mm -hmm. with technology. Uh, it, 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 it can really dramatically build new businesses, but they, they built their own systems from scratch and they're, they're an aggressive user of uh, AI and technology we had and, a, and in places and in places that don't decide whether a, a black person or a white person gets a loan or not, like like a, a, a racist system, but this, all the systems around the bank that interact with uh, human beings, right? We had a, an interview a couple of weeks ago with Ann Bowden, who set, is the technologist who set up a new bank in the UK called Starling Bank, and it, essentially selling the fact that this was ab initio a high tech, new tech bank, of course. 10 years from now, there's going to be somebody come along with even newer, even shinier new tech. And she is going to be the one yep. with a legacy system. Leighton, you have a couple of points to raise. Yeah, um, so I, I was uh, really, one of the things during um, COVID has been the emergence of the emergence of emergency AI and how that's really come to um, exist and in a, in a meaningful way over a very quick period of time. So I think, you know, uh, Google has worked on um, sort of US county level data for three week planning on um, incidents of COVID in hospitals, which I, I found amazing. And it only took two months to, to do that. Um, and yeah. Google said that would usually take years to have that level of data. Uh, or that that level of applied AI. Um, also, the emergence of um, alternative data as a more mainstream use of data. Um, how do you see um, this as having a lasting effect on AI? And I really sort of Christian is, you know, uh, in the applied AI area. Um, so I mean, it's great that you, you, we see applied AI rather than you know just marketing fuzz. Um, okay, Christian, applied AI, and I'm particularly interested in what you have to say about alternative data, alternative real-time economic and financial data in particular. Um, I am just a bit confused with the term applied AI because I haven't seen AI in any other way of uh, thinking about it, <laughs> because AI uh, that we think about is always in applied sentence uh, or, uh, or applied context. And, and for example, I was in uh, Starship Technologies, head of AI, they're responsible for the robots and COVID was uh, like very fundamentally good for them in a sense that, it, that sales expanded because a lot of different cities and universities demanded them because there is no people there. Uh, and they were actually doing like COVID rescue things that were it's most needed and so on. And the same, I already talked about Pactum that uh, during negotiations, uh, first of all, not dealing with humans, but also the fact that if economic conditions change rapidly, there is like a very rapid uh, macroeconomic change, the more people want to renegotiate the contracts. And it is a response yeah. to a COVID situation as well. Um, but, I, I, but I guess you were hinting on more directly uh, related things to, uh, uh, to fighting against COVID, for example, then of course there are like loads of examples there. Um, 
I guess one of the recent uh, uh, promising thing uh, by DeepMind was the neural network that was doing the uh, DNA folding to proteins that is making it possible to uh, uh, develop new disease. And, and basically, if you get the new DNA sequence, you can already know what, how these things are looking like and so on. So I, I would say that in the same way how humans can solve um, and rapidly respond to respond to problems and AI can as well because that these AI is artificially intelligent. Uh, that's the that's the main aim of it being intelligent and solving things. Um, yeah, thank you, Robert. Talk a little bit about uh, real time data, alternative data. How does that fit into what you're doing? When you mean that, what, what are you what are you trying to get to? Well, what I'm trying to think to, to talk about, I'm not sure that anybody else is, is that economics is being fundamentally changed. Uh, we yes. tend to look in the macroeconomic area at sort of, you know, we've used macroeconomics because macroeconomics is too fiddly. Well, all of a sudden, big data uh, means that we can we can use microeconomic data real-time data, sales data, you know, footfall data, all sorts of things like that, that suddenly become accessible through big data and AI. And of course, in the financial services sector, every one of those generates a transaction. And if we have that yeah. transaction in almost real time, then we have a very different view of the overall economy. We're looking not necessarily ahead, but we're looking at the economy as it is now, rather than as the economy was two months ago. Yeah. And, and AI is AI is a very powerful technique to predict what is going to happen tomorrow or what's going to happen in a half a second, right? Um, for instance, if if my entire world was a, it was uh, studied this way, and it's getting closer and closer to this, I'm a, a camera that, like the Facebook portal device that's in my kitchen already with AI in it could be watching how I consume food, right? Could be watching how much milk I have uh, been using in my house. And that, system, and, and that system, and that system, my friend is running uh, R&D at Walmart. We, we're ta he's talking, he's already building systems that's predicting what you're gonna buy so that you don't even need to make a list of what you need. It already made a list for, for what you need and it just asks you to approve it and then it will deliver it with a Starship robot to my house, right? <laughs> the, uh, the knowledge, the system that is being built by Walmart can watch so many transactions that's so largest scale and this is why elon musk is so uh, is warning people about the power of ai that it can see milk demand is go going up in real time in my kitchen right that i'm that people are using more milk this morning than they used yesterday and they can rejigger themselves so now think about how you make uh, uh milk production gear up because uh, all of a sudden more people are buying milk right and the farmer is getting a better price for his milk the 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 supply chain that delivers that milk is geared up and more efficient because of these systems and the consumer gets a new milk just in time right before they run out of the old milk right they're happy too and of course, in the financial services sector, Charlotte, I mean, what we would see there is that it would be predictive people spending patterns against their income yes. patterns, debt, debt problems come up ahead of time. Uh, but it is big brother. It is somebody reaching out of your computer and tapping you on the shoulder and saying, don't spend any more because, you know, you've spent too much and, and poverty lies just uh, two weeks ahead. Yeah. Doesn't yeah, I mean, well, this is the thing. Do you know what, though? Having said all the things I've said, I, I've just been sitting here thinking about my mortgage application process and thinking, God, mm -hmm. I would have I so taken that being being automated. <laughs> so, you know, it, yeah. this is how they get you. It's so convenient. So, so you know, um, it, yeah. it, depends, it depends what the thing is that, it, it, like I've sort of said along, it depends what the thing is that you're automating. I might be comfortable with with uh, that that 
data being shared. Um, I mean, your bank already can see see that data. So I'm I'm kind of like not so worried about that. I I, I wouldn't be maybe so comfortable with uh, I don't I don't know if um if you were a woman using like a fertility app. You might not want someone seeing that data. So you know what I mean? We, you, it has to be partly down to the consumer and what they're comfortable with. Um, and and one lesson that we learn time and time again is that people say that they want privacy, but their, their actions don't really match it. So who knows? We shall see where, where we end up in five to 10 years. I think some some things will be a lot better. Uh, I, I fear some things could be a lot worse, but it's within our power and it's ultimately down to us you know, whether or not we allow uh, the, the worst to happen. I don't think we will. I have more faith in humanity for whatever reason uh, in the last day or so than I did before. <laughs> on that, on, on that uh, very yeah. political comment, uh, can I thank you, uh, Charlotte, can I thank you, Christian, and can I thank you, Robert, and my colleague, Leighton Hughes, and of course, all of you for watching many things.